I can't thank the fans enough for their support. Till this day, honestly, people still support me. But it's like, throughout the time I was there, like that's what made Xavier basketball, Xavier basketball is the fans. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously the players and stuff, but in the coaches, but it's like, those fans aren't there. It's not Xavier basketball because there's no, there's nothing to, to play for. This is the Sean Miller Podcast, presented by Deer Park Roofing. Now, here's your hosts, Paul Fritchner and Adam Baum, with the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller. Welcome into another episode of the Sean Miller Podcast. Paul Fritchner, Adam Baum, the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller. And to my right, a very special guest today, J.P. Makura. As always, we are brought to you by our presenting sponsor, Deer Park Roofing. And also the official payroll sponsor of the Sean Miller podcast. Thanks to, as always, our sponsors at Payroll Partners and TGE Solar. JP, it is great to be here with you today. You are back. Congratulations, because as of a few hours from now, you are a member of the Xavier Class of 2024, the Hall of Fame. So congratulations to you. You are a basketball player here from 2014 to 2018. You made the NCAA tournament all four years that you were here. Went to a Sweet 16 and Elite Eight. And uh, just so much success over your entire career playing alongside Trayvon Blewett and, and so many others. Um, but over the course of your career, uh, you guys ran into each other uh, in the NCAA tournament. And I, I think I'm very interested sitting here seeing you guys next to each other because, JP, you didn't play for Sean, but you guys have certainly run into each other before. Before we get into all of that, though, JP, um, I want to give you the opportunity to tell the people that uh, – maybe are listening to this that haven't followed your career overseas, haven't heard from you in a while, how you're doing, what you're up to, and uh, where you are now. First off, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, currently in Minnesota, rehabbing my back and my hip. Um, played in Italy last year and the previous year, and then Turkey before that. Um, being a full-time dad at home, taking care of my daughter, which is awesome. Um, other than that, just hanging out, taking care of my body, and living life good life the good life there you go <laughs> <laughs> sean this is the first time that we've had a player on that you didn't yeah, coach a, right. a former yeah. xavier player where we're kind of mm -hmm. crossing crossing yeah. over here at jp playing for chris mack we talked a lot about jp when we had chris mack on the show about a month ago but i'll first turn it over to you to ask what your initial memories were of jp and, and playing against him and coaching against him well, yeah, and we did. Uh, JP, when Coach Mack was on, we talked a lot about the, the two games that we went ran up against each other, and it's the irony of it all, right? Like, who would have ever thought that Xavier and Arizona are going to play in Los Angeles and then San Jose in the state of California? Not in the first round either, but in the Sweet 16, which, you know, you only know if you're there when you, when you get to that Sweet 16 – everything is reachable you know it's yeah. almost like you're trying to wrap your mind around like wow here we are if we get it done dream come true and uh i think to be against coach mac against xavier but also against you uh, you know those memories for me are pretty pretty vivid like i mm. i have in my mind how the games went in both games and i'd be curious what comes to your mind when you think back to those two sweet 16 games xavier versus arizona I mean, growing up <laughs> watching basketball and being a fan of basketball, um, Arizona was always a great school. And playing in March Madness against these good teams and, and great players, um, it's just amazing, truthfully, because you grow up in high school, a teacher will give you a little break to, to watch games yep. um, in the middle of school and then to actually play in them is awesome. Um, but playing against Arizona was fun. I mean, you guys both years had really talented teams. Um, I remember more memories, obviously, the second time because it's going advancing um, to the Elite Eight is awesome. But I don't know, it's just a battle. And I know you, you and Mac are good friends, and it's probably really fun for you guys to coach against each other. Um, but it was equally as fun for us to play and, and compete in, in March. So... I just in, enjoyed it a lot. You know, one thing that always struck me about both games, and, and, and this is something that I, I've, I've kind of like taken with me since those games, when you were really a high seed in the NCAA tournament, and we were in both of those years. So in year one, uh, we would have been a, I think a one seed. No, we were a two seed, and then I think we might have been a two seed in the second, the second time we faced each other. Your, guy, your route was much different. You know, the thrill, the, the, 
just a fight in the Big East Conference to make the tournament. I didn't even realize until Coach Mack brought it up. One of those two teams, you guys had lost, I believe, five or six Big East games in a yes. row. Yeah, we had, beat six, the, we yeah. had to beat the Paul to get into the, to the tournament, You I believe. think about losing six games in a row in a regular season. You know, look, that takes a lot of leadership. That takes a lot of resilience. I mean, it's simply easy to say, not this year. And uh, so you guys, like the resiliency of your group, and it's almost like, you have a brand new beginning once the tournament starts. Like, we Fresh. did it. Yep. And I also believe this. And then when you advance, it's like free money. Almost like you don't have any pressure on you. You know, mm -hmm. like if your season ends in the Sweet 16, you're like, can you believe we actually lost six in a row and we got to the Sweet 16, <laughs> right? Yeah. Whereas I'm going to give you, you know, heavy, heavy is the crown. You know, like well, here we are. By the way, if you don't make the Final Four, but you guys didn't get it done. You're it's a one or two seed. And, and you try to not let your team or yourself think that way. But I really felt in both games, we were the favorite. We were supposed to be there. And by the way, you're playing a 12 seed or you're playing Xavier. No one cared that who you guys were or how good you were. It's, mm -hmm. man, look who they are as a seed. This is our opportunity. And I, I really believe this, that in both those games, and that's the amazing part of the tournament, the pressure of the of the actual game itself. So then I would also add, and I'm anxious to hear what you say, you then became a one seed. So yeah. then you lived the life on the other side, and now you felt that opposite pressure of, wait, we're a one seed, we're supposed to get to the final yeah. four. So I guess, you know, in context, the tournament, the pressure of, of it, how different it can feel, and how I think how important it is for us to be loose and, and as much as you can try to be the same as you've been all year. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on that because you experienced a lot of different things in your yeah. four times in the tournament. That's the beauty of the tournament. Um, like you said, it's, you can lose four or five, six games straight and somehow we still made it to March. Um, but I just think that from my freshman to senior year, my freshman year team was really good. Um, but as a senior or and being a really high seed in the tournament, it's like you try to think like, oh, just play loose. But it's also in the back of your mind. You have this you're a one seed and you try not to think we got to get past this first game. Like we people are thinking in the back of their mind, like, oh, we, we can get to the final four. And like that is so far away That's when you right. start the yeah. tournament, because mm -hmm. so many things can happen that one seeds lost before in the first round. It's like anything can happen. And like you said, I think it's just important to, and I think we did, um, just play the same way you played all year and, and, and how you got there. Um, mm -hmm. And if you go down, you go down. And it's sad to lose as a senior and, and you're done playing, but it's like some teams don't even make March, the March Madness. No question. It, I, I've, I've said this a couple of times. To me, the greatest accomplishment here at Xavier both as a team and you were a part of this and as a coach is the fact that you guys were the overall, I mean, you were a one seed. Yeah. Because the one seed, that rewards start to finish. Mm -hmm. And in your case, you know, playing in the Big East Conference, in addition to that, winning the Big East regular season and being a one seed going into the tournament, anything that happens beyond that uh, is a brand new beginning. No different than if you're a 12 seed and you get yeah. to the Sweet 16. But I think what you guys accomplished, in my mind, and we've talked about this, is the greatest accomplishment to this point uh, in, in our program's history. But I don't know if you remember this. Do you remember who you played when you were one seed in the first round? Texas Southern. Yeah. That okay. Jefferson guy. Yeah. Just, <laughs> so we you, remember, you, had your, you had your career high yeah, in that he, game. He was wild. He was a good player. And wild. where was the game played at? I don't know. I don't remember. Paul does. Nashville. <laughs> Nashville. So you were in Nashville, one seed, game one, yeah. Texas Southern? Yeah. So we were playing Weber State in San Diego as a one seed, and I'll never forget this. I think Weber State took the lead 2 nothing, and I, I was, like, out of breath. <laughs> like, oh, shit. You know, like, yeah. because at that point, are we going to, you know, are you going to be the first one seed to, to lose to the Sweet 16? And what, what really got you is – the entire arena almost gave him a standing ovation. Yeah. So, again, back to the tournament. If you're a heavy one seed, a heavy yeah. favorite, you're a one seed, although your crowd is going to be there, trust me, anyone who's not an Arizona or Xavier fan, 
they're cheering against you because they want to be a part of the most lopsided upset yeah. in the history of the tournament where a 16 beats a one. So it's weird pressure is how I yeah. would describe it. You can't let yourself think about it that way. But as a coach and I think as a player. It's hard not to. Yeah, to be able to overcome it, play free. And then usually what happens at some point, you end up being yourself in that game and you end up being the better team, which which happened. But I will never forget that. It's, it's kind of like being a coach of USA basketball. You can imagine, you know, you're in, in Greece and, you know, you're playing in the semifinal. And if you ever lose as a USA basketball coach or player, you feel like this amazing failure. I can't describe yeah. it. And you go down 2 nothing or 4 nothing, and you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> <What else? laughs> so it's, It makes uh, you want to go out there and play. Again, it, it, it makes... It, you, you said it. It's what makes March Madness March Madness. It's why it captivates the world, the sports fans. And uh, it's it's so amazing, like, when you guys leave college and we have these podcasts and we start talking about your career, inevitably every one of you guys points towards the games, the moments in, yeah. in, in, in the NCAA tournament. Uh, what is your favorite NCAA tournament moment? Is, is it winning the Sweet yeah. 16? <laughs> you guys, for I sure. Because so. uh, yeah. we <laughs> fell short before, but I don't know. It just The way the game ended, too, was pretty cool for us, at least. But yeah. Um, but going back to the like the seasons before that, it's like being 11 seed 7, I don't remember exactly what we were um, over the years, but like there's no pressure. Like We just show yeah. up and we're like, we're, we're ready to play. And then you have the one seed and you're like, it, I mean, it's everybody in the back of their mind, they're like, we have to win this game. And it's just a little yeah. bit more pressure, obviously. But, but looking back at it, it was just an unbelievable experience all four years. And it's just the, the best thing in the world playing in March. What, what was it like for you the second time around having to play Florida State again after what you guys did to them the year before? It was tough because we got, I don't remember what the play was called, but we, we set a back screen and got like four or five layups the first time we played them. Yeah. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't either pass or do anything. Mm -hmm. They would just screen, hit, layup, screen, hit, layup. Play on the second time, nothing. Like we screened, eye on the pass, couldn't even get a layup on that. Um, but I mean, it is tough to play a little bit different of a team, but it's, it's tough to play the same team over the years. Yeah. Um, and I'm, we got matched up with them again. I wish like, playing Florida State as in year one seed is tough because Florida State's usually mm -hmm. pretty good. They got athletes, they got good yeah. players, and I was ready to go. I was ready to play. I did fall out, but some questionable falls. Um, <laughs> but I was ready to play. It was fun, but we just couldn't finish. Couldn't finish the job, and that's like I said, that happens in March, and it sucked that it was us, but it's the way it goes. Um, those guys were probably fired up, uh, but. Yeah, just there's no can't, middle can't ground. Them all. <laughs> there's no middle ground in the tournament because the loser, it's over. Careers end, seasons end. Yeah. There's not another practice. As a matter of fact, there's not another uh, media session. You almost feel like you're kicked out of the tournament because yeah. when you're in it, it feels so great. And when you win, it's indescribable. You know, you're on this path and journey that you've usually dreamed about since you were a little kid. Yeah. And it's like you're living it. And the, and the difference, the discrepancy is, is, is immense. It, it really is. The Sean Miller Podcast is proud to partner with Deer Park Roofing, a company that's provided elite service for homes and businesses since 1996 and leads the industry in professionalism, quality, and responsiveness. Whether your needs are residential or commercial, like the outstanding work on the Cintas Center, the home of Xavier Basketball, Deer Park can handle any job and ensure it's done right. Deer Park's motto is protect what's important, and what's important to you is important to Deer Park Roofing. Visit DeerParkRoofing.com. You know, JP, when I think of you as a player, the one thing that I really that really stands out for me is your defense. And in particular, and I give Coach Mack a lot of credit, using your unique skill set at the top of this zone, which uh, to this point, I don't even know what to call that zone. It was kind of like a mixture between a 1-3-1 one, one and a 2-3. No, no rules. Yeah, no, it was like a kind <laughs> of like... rules, more fun. <laughs> <laughs> no question. And you felt that as the opponent because the lack of structure with it, you know, just kind of made sometimes your players be apprehensive. And you at the top, because of your gift of being able to steal the ball, uh, 
I, I thought it was really a big identity of of your teams. And yeah. you know, do you remember when uh, when that first was introduced? Because I know coach is a man-to-man coach. Yeah. Xavier's a man-to-man program historically. And, you know, all of a sudden you're like, wow, what, what kind of defense is that? You got this guy McCure up the top and yeah. he, he looks like he can get a lot of steals. And the next thing you know, like it was a big problem for a lot of teams. Yeah. I mean, I think they put it in because at one point we weren't getting as many stops as we should have been getting. Yeah. And um, there were a few rules in it. Honestly, it's just my job at the top was to have them fill the ball over my head. No straight line passes or bounce passes. Just make them lob it. And then once it gets to the corner, force some baseline and take a mid-range jump shot. And everybody was supposed to contain. And, I mean, we put it in and we played a game pretty quickly after that. And then I'm sure we made some mistakes. But over time, we just got more comfortable and had more fun with it. And it helped me out because I could actually just play completely wild. And yeah. looking back as a freshman... Um, I'm probably going to talk about this tonight in my speech a little bit, but Mac had an open door in his office. Like, you'd go in and mm-hmm. ask him questions. You could talk about basketball, anything. And I'd often go in there and be like, what, can I play more? Like, can I play the games? Like, get more minutes? Mm-hmm. And it'd end with, well, you need to play defense. And as a freshman, I was trying to guard Remy, Abel, and some of the seniors who are freak athletes. And I just... I couldn't keep anybody in front of me and I, I couldn't do it. Like it was fresh out of high school, 175, 180 pounds, just, just a little kid out there. And over time I got better, could move my feet a little bit faster and then just kind of realized the angles and stuff like that. And when they put in the pack line defense, obviously it was here before me, but that helped me a lot. Cause I could finally understand like get in the gap, have some space. Mm-hmm. Don't be all outside the three point line and get burned. But over time, I got a little bit better at defense, and then the one three one helped me a ton. So, I mean, over the years, it was it was really fun to just kind of grow in that way. Yeah, no, and 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 look, your gift of being able to get deflections and steals and use, you know, an uncanny athleticism. You know, people aren't going to say JP McCure is really quick and jumps high, but you're an incredible athlete. Mm. You know, you have this way of getting your hands on the ball and to disrupt defense, disrupt offense that not a lot of players do. You know, TJ McConnell, different but the same. When you look at him and you see him, there are guys who run faster, jump higher, that are bigger, but he has that same effect. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that the NBA really underestimated when they valued him. They looked at him as like a defensive liability because of his physical measurements. Yeah. They didn't understand he has this uncanny ability to get steals. And he actually is a big reason why he's still in the NBA is his ability to defend. And yeah. I think the same thing for you. Your ability to impact winning at Xavier and have a pro career, uh, it's it's like this gift that you have to be able to disrupt on defense. Yeah. I mean, it's one-on-one with an athlete. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to stay in front. So it's going to be tough, but... <laughs> Five on five, which that's the only play five on five. It's it's pretty effective to be able to get loose balls, tips, and, and stuff like that. So shit talking, I put you at the top. I, I, I think you can get under opponent's skin. In a, in, by the way, in a positive way. Yeah. Sometimes guys that talk can not only screw up the other team, but they can screw up, A, themselves well, and their own team. They just don't know what they're saying. They're just... Right. So when, tell calculated. me, when did this become a part of, of you as a player? Because we're going to talk between the lines. This has not who yeah. people are off the court. We've all yeah. seen it. Some guys are the nicest guys off the court, but on the court, it's like, is this the same yeah. player? You on the court, so you have this crazy, weird defensive ability, and shot making and high basketball IQ. And it's almost like you're another point guard on the court because of how you see the game on offense. You make everybody better. Yeah. But this other part is being able to get under the opponent's skin mm-hmm. and, and just really disrupt them in a psychological way. Uh, I'd, I'd honestly say when I was really little, my brother is two years older than me. And him and his friends used to beat the shit out of me in, in everything, <laughs> physically, sports, just. And I had to do something. So I would mm. just run my mouth. I, I, when I was younger, I was reckless, like just saying whatever. And then kind of growing up, going playing AU, that's just kind of just 
kept doing it. And there's times where I just, believe it or not, wouldn't say much. And then times where I do. Um, but high school, I didn't, didn't talk too much, a little bit here and there. I mean, I'm sure I got a handful of technicals. But once I got to college, I just kind of, something triggered. I don't know exactly what it was, but it could have, I think it started with just competing in practice because yep. Mac had practices great where it was fun to go to. You, it was a battle and yeah. just started running my mouth a little bit there and probably overstepped my boundaries a bit. But then when we started playing in games, it was just people would come at me, um, try to test me in the game. And like, I'm not just going to sit there and say nothing. That's just not really mm -hmm. how I've been. Um, but I've had people tell me in games, like, I'm going to punch you in the face. And I'd be like, <laughs> do it. Like, <laughs> you'll be out. I'll probably have a black eye, but I'll still be in the game. Um, I, I, it's probably happened a hundred times, literally. And that's just kind of how I've been, been rolling ever since I got to Xavier or before Xavier. And I know I just, I just get a joy out of it. Cause you got people who I pick and choose. Like there's some guys you just don't talk to cause they're, you're not going to get underneath their skin. Like they're, mm -hmm. they just don't do that. And then other guys, you say a word and they're in your face. And I just kind of feel that out and see who, who I'm going to talk to and, and what, what not. I remember playing at DePaul one time. I started talking to somebody, and Rick was coaching there, and he said, don't talk back to him. Like, don't say a word. And I started talking to this guy, and, like, nobody was talking back to me. Like, not one player. So I was like, I'm done. Like, I'm not going to say a word because there's, there's nobody yeah. entertaining it. Um, but just things like that, I mean, so I how, can, how, do choose you, my how do you feel out who's a good target? You, you could tell. There's some, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, there's some hot heads out there that you, you, you can tell that you, you got yeah. one right when you, when you see them. It's, it's pretty easy. I don't know. It's hard to explain, but you could probably even see it in warm-ups. Like, oh, this guy, he's, right. he's going to want to punch me or do something crazy. But I don't know. I just, I know, just get, I, I get I think it, it develops a little bit. And, you know, we share one, a number of things that are common. Both, we both played in the Big East. You know, I played at Pitt, but when – you know, I played at Pitt. Pitt was a fixture in the Big East, you know, and that was the old days. But, you know, one thing about this conference, it you're either going to rise to the level of the competition and the physicality and, you know, the toughness that I think everybody embodies in this league. It's always been that way. Or, or, or you're just you're going to get out. You're going to seek, seek shelter otherwhere, yeah. other, uh, at another place and, and transfer or go about things differently. But if you're going to stick it out and, and you're going to be a part of this conference, you you have to rise to the challenge of toughness. And I think back to, like, who I would have been day one, I'm sure the same would be true for you. As a freshman, you're feeling things out. Sometimes you learn because, wow, I didn't do well. Like, I failed that test. But you keep that competitive fire, and then you learn, and you figure out, look, in order for me to survive first before I ever thrive here, I have to raise my level yeah. of competition. And you know what's unique when I listen to you talk? I think about how different it is today. And I think everybody's fear on how college basketball is set up today is that it's so easy to run away from not playing as much. You know, you say, I want to play more. And you're trying to figure out what is it that I can do to get on the court more. Yeah. Today's guys have the opportunity. Well, I can get on the court more. I'm just going to change my coach. I'm going to change my place and it'll be interesting to see five years down the road or seven years down the road how that works out but when you played it was a different day and age and I think it developed you spoke to it without you develop a maturity and growth and like your college experiences you walk in as this high school wide open young person yeah. you're learning in a classroom but maybe your best classroom at times is what you're learning in competitive sports. And, sure. and when you leave here, think about your mindset and all the experiences you gained, and it's forever. It defines you. Yeah. And that's, I think, sometimes what not enough people talk about, how the model used to be versus today. And in today's model, there's some really good as well. But my hope is that it doesn't turn into the future JPs when they have that initial obstacle in adversity as a freshman that their instinct is to change versus learn, grow, fight through it. Because when you come out on the other side, you're so much better. It's rewarding. I mean, 
looking back at it as a freshman, there's first couple months, probably even half a year, I was just, I didn't know what was going on. All I knew was go to practice, practice as hard as I possibly can and go home, do it again, go home, do it again. And it's like, I had joy in that because I knew every day I got to go to practice, it was super competitive, super fun. And that, like, that's why I love basketball is so I can go and play, compete and go head to head with guys. Um, but now, I mean, with college basketball now, my concern is that, I mean, there's a handful, not a handful, but a lot of people who play that way. And now it's easy. You could transfer. You can go somewhere else if you don't like it. But it's like, it, that's, that's not a short, like, that's such a short-term fix, not even a fix. It's like, you go somewhere else, like you said, like, that could be five, six, seven years down the road. Like, you don't like your job. You can just go get a new job. Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't work like that. You got to be able to go straight on, go to practice, compete. If someone's better than you, be better than them. I mean, mm -hmm. beat them for their spot. And if you don't, if you don't, wait your turn. Try to get better every single day. And at least for myself, that's why I love Xavier and coming to practice every single day is because it's like there's no off days. Like mm. you're here to get better. You're here to play. And that's what we did over my four years. And that's why we were successful. And sure, there are times where like, damn, this is tough. Like what happens if I would have went somewhere else? No. But I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to stay here forever. Like this is my spot. Like I'm getting better at the end of the day. Like if I go somewhere else, I might not get better. Like what I'm doing here is amazing and I'm getting better every day. And that's, that's why I loved it so much. And that's kind of why every day down one through however many guys on the team, like even the walk-ons, everybody was busting their ass and, and getting better. So that's why I loved it. And I wouldn't change it for the world. JP, I, I believe the Cintas center is one of college basketball's best arenas not only physically how it looks like it, it's hard for me sometimes to tell someone who visits here that our building is about 27 years old. I think I'm, I'm, I'm right there. 2000. So 20, 24. Now. I'm sorry. 24 yeah. years yeah, old. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, all the facts. I, that's why I'm here. JP. <laughs> the encyclopedia. He, is, he does have an amazing Xavier basketball memory bank. That's all he knows. <laughs> it's good, not good for anything. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, it pays the bills. <laughs> but you've played in a lot of hostile visiting arenas. You've been all around the world right now. So you have how it feels and how it looks because it doesn't look or feel 24 years old. It, to me, it looks new. Yeah. But the other part of it is I always try the best I can to explain to anybody that loves Xavier basketball, what's the greatest gift you can give our program? Buy season tickets and then always make sure somebody's in those seats. Hopefully it's you, but in the event that the sunshine of Florida calls you for a day, a week, a month, <laughs> Yeah. During that time where you're not here, somebody's got to be in there because the most competitive advantage that we have is game day in the Centos. And yeah. as somebody who's been around and been here for four years, can you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, it's the greatest place in the world. I, uh, it gives me chills thinking about it, honestly, because you kind of take it for granted when you're in school. Um, looking back at it, obviously, it's the, the best arena of, I've played in as far as like a home place, but like just the support from the community and the fans is, is truth, truthfully amazing. Um, sometimes you, you can't even hear coach when you're playing. Mm -hmm. And that's honestly what's fun. It's like coach Mack when we were in college, usually at Cincinnati and here when we played them, it's like, it's a player's game. If you can't hear me, go play. And th those are some of the most fun games, but the support that these people give is, is amazing. Um, being able to come and play in front of all the fans, and it's way louder than you'd think, um, but you have to be able to play or experience or go to the game to understand how crazy it is. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, that's truthfully the only way I can explain it, but it's just, I can't thank the fans enough for their support till this day, honestly. People still support me, but it's like throughout the time I was there, like that's what made Xavier basketball, Xavier basketball is the fans. I mean, mm. obviously the players and stuff, but in the coaches, but it's like those fans aren't there. It's not Xavier basketball because there's no, there's nothing to, to play for. And mm. once you start winning games and playing in front of these fans, it's like, you just want to keep doing it, keep winning, keep playing. And it's like, 
I would go back in a heartbeat and play again. Obviously, I used my four years, but <laughs> it was some of the best experience of my life, for sure. Did you ever play Dayton? I think we played him once and beat him by 30. You killed him. Oh, that was, yeah. that was you, the last you, you time. Played we played him in an exempt yeah. tournament. You played him in a in a in Florida. Yeah. Destroyed him. You want, yeah. the, you want the final score? It was 91 to 67. Yeah, I think my brother right. was You're the nuts. coach. <laughs> he, just had, he just podcast about this. I was yeah, about, they nice. were talking about that game. But yeah. the, my brother was the coach. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That would have been Yeah, in Florida. That yeah, would have been the yeah. fall of 2015. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, um yeah. <laughs> That, when I think of the Centaur Center, it, it's crazy. Everybody talks about the Crosstown shootout, and, and that speaks for itself. But when we played Dayton, uh, it, it was like at, a, at another level. And one of the things that made it at another level is the student section would have, you know, I think the right term is the fat heads of the presidents of the United States when the last time that Dayton beat Xavier here in the Centaur Center or here in Cincinnati because it used to be in the gardens. Must have had a lot of... Who was no, 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 Paul? <laughs> so the first fathead would be a president and it was almost... I remember thinking like, now which, which president is that? Because it was so long ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm trying to... I'm trying... Come I'm gonna, on. Uh, yeah, don't this worry. Is, the internet this, will let yeah, us know. Yeah, the internet's yeah. going to get me on this one. Yeah, I don't remember who the first one would have been because it's been... Was it been, Lincoln? <laughs> sure, yeah, we can go back that far if you want. Yeah, no, but, but see, Nixon. Honestly, I I think I think it would be Nixon, Nixon, right? or Reagan. Maybe I hope you're wrong so people control you. Oh God, yeah, it probably because I can. I'm trying to picture them, but, but I want you to think way. about this: yeah. the the pressure you feel because they were in our league, so we shared a conference. Like this isn't a like the crosstown shootout. Yeah, you play every year, home or away, right? This is you play them at home every single year. And yeah. when you do that and you start lining these presidents up <laughs> and it's not far from their bench, you know, the, the game takes on like a different level because at some point, it's, it's back to our point about the NCAA tournament. At what point is this streak going to end, you know? And uh, one time David West was playing, and I think it's David's greatest game as a college player. We were in big trouble against UD at home. And again, that streak, which I think – at that point, it was decades long, even yeah. more so, playing him every year at home. He went for 47 and 18, yeah. and we needed every point. <laughs> but the night that day in the Centaur Center, in my mind, I have a burned-in image. It might have been the loudest and most amazing arena that I've ever been in, you know, for, for any game. So, yeah, you, you missed that part, but you were part of a lot of other ones. The Villanova game at home, which would have been your senior year. Uh, a lot of people bring that up as maybe the loudest that they remember the Centaur Center. Anytime we played them, because we, we couldn't beat them at their place. Yeah. That's for sure. They were they they were unbelievable. Coach wow. Mack had a fun way of describing that game, right? The home or away? The away game. I don't I I don't I don't hold those memories. <laughs> <laughs> we got just destroyed every time. Um, but playing home against them was pretty special. Um, just because their roster, well, mm -hmm. now they're all in the NBA, but like oh, most that's of them, right. but it's like they had a legitimate roster. Yeah. And to beat those guys, um, we they were one and we were three, five, five. And then we lost to Seton Hall the next game or Providence. I don't know. Yeah. But no, that was to beat the number one team in the country is the most difficult away arena. You've talked about Villanova, aside from Villanova for you in the Big East Conference would be what? I, I'd probably say Butler for myself, mm -hmm. not for my team, because those. Uh, ever since I got in trouble, those people <laughs> just ripped me apart, which is fine. Like that's it didn't bother me. I, I I'm the first one on the floor on the away games because I want to go talk to the people without the refs out there, <laughs> and just playing there. I, I just loved playing there. It, it was so fun. I remember somebody having a poster with my phone number on it, and. I was like, one, how did they get that? And two, like, why is it up? And uh, Jeremy at the time went and they took it down. But they actually called my grandma and they said, hey, this is JP's friend. And I don't know how they got her number. And she gave them my cell phone number and then they put it on the poster. And the night before I had, I was in a group message with like 30 Butler fans. And they just put me in this 
big group message, and they were just saying all this shit. And Did I, you respond? I, yeah, I took a <laughs> T-shirt from the chair. Like, they had T-shirts on the chairs, and I put it in the toilet, took a picture of it, sent it back to the group. <laughs> and um, obviously that got them heated as well, but I, it's just playing there is incredible. It, it's, it's just... Wow, Hinkle Fieldhouse Butler would have been the most difficult. For me, at least. Because yeah, every time mm -hmm. I touched the ball or got in the mm -hmm. game, they were just... Ripped me you. apart. So when um, you stole that ball on that inbounds at the very end of that game, and I was gonna dunk it regardless. Yeah, like that, like, no question. <laughs> Mac would have done the same thing too. So don't <laughs> let him tell you any different. No, but that place is great to play. I'm trying to think anywhere else. Um, that was well, you didn't I get know, UConn. Hall in Providence. Those playing there mm -hmm. was tough, um, really tough. Um, Marquette on National Marquette Day was tough because I feel like every time we went there it was that yeah. Marquette Day, whatever that means. Creighton was tough too, but I don't know. Butler was definitely up there for yeah. sure. And you didn't and you didn't have UConn. Yeah. Nope. So, you know, I, I think adding UConn to it gives you another because the one thing about UConn, you could play them in Hartford or you could play them on campus. They're different, but I think both represent great home courts, yeah. obviously. You know. That's obviously. The, the beauty of the Big East though, is like yep. mostly all schools arenas are great and they're tough to play at and that's all you can ask for you don't want to go somewhere it's easy like well at least not me i want to go play somewhere where they're fired up no you're right they uh, care about that packed. they care about college basketball at every venue and for the most part you're going to get a sellout or near sellout and you're going to get you know the crowd's best shot because winning at home in a big east conference is is something you have to do to be yeah. successful no doubt Stop renting your power, own it. TGE Solar makes it easy to purchase solar panels for your home or business so you can take control of your monthly electricity bill and start saving today. They'll help you find the best solar system to meet your needs, and their expert in-house installation team makes the process seamless. They're proud to be based in Cincinnati, family-owned and operated by a Xavier alum. Mention this podcast and save $1,000. Visit TGEsolar.com to request your free energy evaluation today. I think it was Jimmy Carter. So all the people that have been yelling for the last 10 minutes in the car trying mm -hmm. to figure out what president that was, I think it was Jimmy Carter. Yeah. So it's we been were that. in the arena. We were right there. Yeah, we were right there. Yeah. It was all the way around. Uh, <laughs> TJ McConnell. We talked about TJ McConnell, and you talk about going back and forth with you guys in that game. Yeah. Coach, I want to start with you. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about TJ and JP playing against each other? I'm glad we had TJ, first of all, because uh, it, JP – as he explained, you know, you're going to, if you're him, you try to target somebody on the other team to get under their skin. In TJ's case, JP would be able to get under his skin, but TJ's also well-equipped and talented in that Very, same area. Yeah. So you kind of have a clash of two titans. Uh, to me, that, that would do nothing but put him in a position to be at his best, you know? What you worry about is what JP described, and that is the same conversation happens during a game and it steals the other guy's mind, and next thing you know, it works against your team if you're the visitor, so. But I wasn't worried about it. I, You know, it was a while back. I know both of them kind of had their little, little tit for tat, but yeah. the one thing is I made sure that TJ was aware before the game started a couple things. That Coach Mack didn't think he was a good player, and didn't think he was good enough to play for Arizona, which I made sure he understood that message. <laughs> and then the second message, hey, they got this guy, he's a freshman. And when he comes in the game, he he, he talks. Like, you you got to be alert and ready to go. And he's really, he's talented with his hand. Like, he can, he can he can deflect and steal. And he's got a little bit of you in him. Just make sure you're, on, you're aware and have your teammates aware of this guy. Like, don't underestimate him. Because back then, JP wasn't the JP of his senior year. He would have been a first-year yeah. player. Yeah, completely wild as a freshman. <laughs> <laughs> what do you remember about that playing against TJ? I mean, he's a super talented player. Um, kind of got those guys rolling in the right direction since he was there. Um, but just vividly remember the moment when he, I don't, I for sure started it. I'm going to go ahead and say <laughs> that. Like, I don't remember what I said because it's, it's a lot. Um, but just before a timeout, he came up to me and said, I'm the white guy around here. <laughs> and I, you know, I was just in the tournament. I was a freshman. And I was like, at, well, at, at that point, I was like, I didn't say anything immediately because I was like, damn, 
You are like you are the white guy around here. Like I, I'm not gonna lie, but all right. Walked away, and then after the timeout, he came back and said he apologized, and that means he's a great guy. Uh, apologized and said I'm sorry, and I was like, eh, no, no problem. And then I think I just took a different direction, found a different different player <laughs> Never to talk to. Yeah. I don't think I played a ton, but I I, I definitely targeted somebody else. <laughs> One of the great moments I had uh, with TJ. We were at UTEP, and it's hard to describe what a home game at UTEP is like, especially if you're Arizona coming to UTEP. <clears throat> and they had, I believe at that point, a sellout crowd. It had been some time since they had a crowd like that. It was that same year, so we were highly ranked. And I knew right away, like, as soon as we were out there at warm-ups, jump ball, oh, God, why did I schedule this game? You know, it's, it's going to be really difficult. Crowd is absolutely bonkers and we got off to a great start there was a, a guy behind our bench he wasn't a student i came to realize this is one of those hecklers you know it's something he does all the time i don't know if he's still there at utep but anyway he sat real close to the visitor's bench and he he's that guy who knew everything about you or me and he would just try to get under your skin but he was so close to your bench that you heard every word he said and he targeted TJ, and he targeted him in warm-ups and early in the game. I wasn't really aware of it, although I started to hear this annoying voice right behind me, and it's just like, who is this guy? You know, We had a quick timeout up early, and uh, I'm talking, facing the court. We're in a 30-second timeout. Our five players are facing the crowd, facing the bench, and guys are drinking Gatorade like you would do, right? Orange Gatorade, you know, or am I listening? And I'll never forget, I looked at TJ, and he was, like, distracted, you know, so he was kind of like acting like he was listening yeah. to me, but I didn't have his attention. And sure enough, this guy was letting him have it, and he was looking at him behind. And he went like he was drinking a Gatorade, and as soon as I turned my head, JP, he flipped the Gatorade bottle, and he like literally went right by my ear, orange Gatorade. It'd be, be like, he's on the court, you're the guy behind the bench, and he drills the guy <laughs> with this orange Gatorade. And he, did, he didn't do it for like a quick, he went like... You know, like two yeah. seconds, three seconds. Well, the guy had like a tie on. He was coming from work. Like he was a professional. Good. And all of a sudden, again, I had no idea what's happening. There's a scene, you, you know, feel something happening behind you and in front of you. And it's this chaotic environment. This guy is going wild. Next thing you know, police are coming down and the security people and like, what in the world is going on? Ah, and uh, I had a leak. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. and, and so the game goes on. And like, I remember maybe asking, like, what, 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 it, what happened? Well, after the game, I walk in the locker room. Every, everyone's laughing, whatever. And sure enough, these guys tell me the story. And he had drilled this guy. And this guy, I think, was escorted out of the game. You know? But he's, he, he was one of a kind when it came to different things like that. And uh, a lot like yourself, his emotional state and mindset had a great effect on his teammates, you know? If you can do it, if you can do it that way, it's it's the best way. <laughs> it can be a lot of different ways that don't don't help out help you out. But I funny story, we played Butler and Matt Stanbrook did the same thing to a fan. We lost and we were walking out, just drilled this person in the face. But we had already lost. We we're like, whatever. Um, that's the biggest problem I run into is in a game with people like that, because I can't do much, because if I do, I'll probably get a technical. Right. Definitely in Europe, you'll get a technical. Um, but that's why I just get there earlier before the game. And uh, they can't give me a technical two hours before. I'm, <laughs> I'm talking to work, great, work done early. It's called the game within the game. That's a right. great competitor. <laughs> you know, he goes the extra mile to give his team an advantage. And I, again, me coaching against you because, you know, I didn't co coach coach you I was aware of who you were because of you know coach Mack and following Xavier the way I did but playing against you in two sweet 16s I think the greatest compliment that I could that I can pay you as, a, as a, an opposing coach is just your impact on the game was everywhere it wasn't just on offense or just on defense it was clearly on both but it was your leadership and you know your charisma and your your competitive spirit that just it just made a game against Xavier a little bit more difficult, you know. And I think in recruiting, you know, if you were a college coach, JP, you would be hunting that characteristic because mm -hmm. somebody who has it, you only know if it's you, how big of an advantage that is to have guys on your team that think that way. Yeah, I appreciate the comments. I really do. Um, it's probably tough as being a, being a coach and trying to recruit people like that, though, is because it's hard to tell. Right, it's like no doubt, you have to almost have inside information. 
That's, or you have to have played against yeah, or that person and felt it yourself. Go watch and kind of yep. see it, but it's yeah. it's tough to find. It really is. Um, but I wouldn't trade trade anything that I've done at Xavier for the four years on the basketball court. It's really, really fun. The way I think about it is JP, <laughs> when I watched him play, he's he's one of those guys where it's like, if he's on your team, if he's your teammate, if he plays for your your school, you love him. You'd do anything for him. If he's not, you hate him. Mm. And that's it's fine, like, though. I, I got to play <laughs> for yeah. the other schools. <laughs> I know, but that, that's, that's like he paid you a compliment. That's yeah. one of the best yeah. compliments you can give a guy is like, if everyone else hates you, but the people that you need that, that support you and that are a part mm -hmm. of your program, if they love you, like – that speaks volumes. That's all, that's all we need. Yeah. Only the people in the circle. That's it. JP, you scored right around 1,500 points. All four years you were at Xavier, you made the NCAA tournament. When you left here, I believe you're either tied or you're in first place. Well, you'd be tied with one of your teammates, probably Trayvon, for the most NCAA tournament wins in school history, seven. Yeah. I believe that's true as I've kind of looked, looked that part up. And, uh, you know, just being around you and listening, you know, 1,500 points or however many rebounds and steals and assists. And I think you touched every one of those areas. But uh, the, the, the impact that you had statistically is just part of the story. I think the other part of it is that competitive fire, being in the locker room, being in practice, the leadership that, that you had is something going to carry you a long, long way. And that would be my next question. Have you ever thought about being a coach? I've done some thinking over the past five months with being somewhat injured and not playing this season, what I'm going to do. Um, I've definitely thought about it and, and what I want to do after, um, but I'm definitely going to try to get healthy, play for some more years if I can, and then figure out what I'm going to do next. But it, I would like to coach eventually, but I, I, f I feel like my competitiveness, I, someone's going to have to be by me during the game because I'm going to get kicked out or something. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, your I, interaction with I, officials I, could be I, interesting. I, I <laughs> hopefully it can change with some time, but man, I there's some bad refs out there, and I, <laughs> no, I don't believe that. <laughs> oh, there are. And, and no, I'm well aware. <laughs> I'm gonna have to calm down a little bit. I've calmed down a little bit ever since my daughter was born, but I'll, I I would be heated. But I, I <laughs> even looking back to this past summer when we came for the TBT and watching practice and watching you coach. Just, it wasn't even like a, I don't even, it was just more of a workout, honestly. And just like the competitiveness and how much fire you had, fire you had while coaching. Like I, it just, I got the chills. It was, it was great um, to watch all the guys compete and play for one another. I just, being on, a, on the college floor would be amazing to mm -hmm. just kind of re-energize that four years that I was, I was here for. Have you ever gone ice fishing? No, I don't get on the ice. I'm too... These guys, I, you are you guys aware of ice fishing if you're from Minnesota? Oh, yeah. It better JP. be ne negative yeah. 30 degrees for a month before I'm walking on that ice. <laughs> <laughs> so I was uh, an assistant coach at Wisconsin. That would have been my first job. I was called the restricted earnings coach. Story for another day. A young guy, there was no GAs then, and I got my opportunity. Stu Jackson would have been the head coach, and Stan Van Gundy would have been one assistant it was an amazing learning experience in the Big Ten. But being from Pittsburgh, I was not scared of the cold. And at that point, I grew up in Pittsburgh. I went to the University of Pittsburgh. That's the place that I knew. So, you know, when you think of winter, you think of gray, cold, wet, cloudy. It is what it is. It's basketball season. Yep. And I went to Wisconsin, and uh, it was certainly another level of cold. But what I remember vividly is driving in real early, dark outside, and seeing what appeared to be fire on these lakes. Because at Wisconsin, you probably know, like, they have two yeah. lakes on the other side of their campus. And these fires, like, on their lakes, I'm just like, am I seeing fire on a lake? It didn't make sense to me. Yeah. And sure enough, I asked the question, and like, no, no, no. Ice fishing in Minnesota and Wisconsin during the winter is a thing. Like, a people go on thing, a yeah. week's vacation— Camp out, live on the ice, drill a hole, and yeah, my hope is that you were going to say you knew knew about it. I just don't have the patience. I, I, <laughs> I'm trying to become more patient, but I I've gone fishing before, not ice fishing, but I just I just can't do it. 
I'll go out there maybe if my friends want to do it, but I don't. I've truthfully never gone on the ice and fished. Mm. Maybe I should try it. How cold are the winters in Minnesota relative the, to the other places you've lived since? It's by far the coldest, but this winter has not been that cold. Like there's mm. been no snow, which has been great. It's my first time back for the whole winter mm. and it's not that cold. But when you get like some, some winters in Minnesota are absolutely brutal. Yeah. Like always in the negatives. And it's just, that's what I'm used to. But then going to coming out here, playing professionally for some years, it's just, I wasn't home. Right. And now it's, I'm home. It's not that bad, which is nice. So you're so. not seeking like warm weather when you eventually retire and get back to the States. You're not seeking the, not I don't entirely. want to deal with winters. May, maybe when I'm older, but not right now. I'm fine. It's, as long as there's not two feet of snow, I, I can deal with it. <laughs> the Sean Miller Podcast is proud to partner with Payroll Partners, where you're not just a number. That means providing a best-in-class HR and payroll experience that was built on award-winning technology and live support customer service with a dedicated payroll specialist who's just a phone call away. You shouldn't have to choose between technology and customer service. At Payroll Partners, you get both. Payroll Partners is locally owned and operated by a proud Xavier alum. Visit payrollpartners.net. That's payrollpartners.net. Welcome back to the Sean Miller Podcast, as always, presented by Deer Park Roofing. JP, uh, we really haven't gotten too much to talk about this yet, so I want to tee it up for you and just leave the door open. Do you have any uh, specific memories or anything that sticks out to you or any stories you want to share here on this show? This is your platform to uh, to talk about the Crosstown Shootout. Well, I want to first say I was not just me, but the players I played with were 3-1, and one, and that's a pretty good record in my eyes against Cincinnati. Um, we should have been 4-0, and oh, but the any time we beat them is the most incredible thing in the world because they're... I don't like them at all. Um, but when we played there, we actually lost. And Trayvon had about, I don't like 40. No, 40, 40, yeah, 40. No. 40. Quincy, Quincy just scored 43, and I was asking yeah. the question, who else has scored 40? Because David yeah. West, I, I mentioned his game. And when they told me that Trayvon scored 40-plus at UC, uh, especially against Coach Cronin, I mean, that, that right there has to be one of the all-time great performances. We had... 20 or 20 something, maybe 21 points at halftime, but he missed a three. Maybe, maybe he made it, but he would, he almost had 22, 23 points at halftime. And I was like, this is the one of the best performances I've ever seen. I'm not going to talk about personal performance against Cincinnati because I don't really care. But the we ended up losing that game, but the the crowd and the atmosphere was probably the best, the, the, like the most crazy game that I played in in college um and for him to score that many points and for us to lose but the the fans were incredible like our fans were were there tons of them but just kind of the four over the four years the four games we played it was just like you could not hear coach like you couldn't and he'd often say like hey if you can't hear me play and and that's sometimes with certain players like that's better in a sense because they just don't think too much and they go and play. And at Cincinnati, the two times we played there, it was just super fun to play in the environment. But then playing here and beating them, um, not only beating them, but like actually beating them is rewarding. And the thing with Mick Cronin um, really capped it off. Um, it's great. It's great to beat them and have them fired up. Um, but just over over the four years, it was, it was really fun to play those guys and ultimately beat them more than they beat us and, yeah. and that's that's the goal yeah we talked an awful lot about trash talk on this episode sean how was your trash talk back in the day i wasn't jp like uh, <laughs> i'll tell you that but i you know uh, when you were when we were talking to him and and i was listening to him talk i started to reflect back on my own experience and he touched on it when you're young coming in this conference, you know, I had some great teachers, guys on my team, playing pickup games uh, every day, the older guys being hard on you. 
uh, trying to teach you uh, what it feels like to play in college basketball as somebody who just showed up. Uh, you learn a lot of valuable lessons, and then you learn the equal lessons as a young player in the league. And I'd say that all of us, if you get to the end, your sense of pride and fight and will almost allow you to have permission to be confident and to be better in that area. At the end, I could hold my own. Uh, I certainly wouldn't have been the guy that you'd want to pick on like he was describing, but uh, it, playing in this conference, man, I, I, again, I, I'm coaching in it now. This is not for the faint of heart. Like you, This isn't the conference you, I want to play basketball in college. I mean, this is battles, and individually you have battles. You have battles, like he described what it feels like to play an away game, the value of trying to win at home, and what it feels like when a shot goes up, blocking out, offensive rebound, and guarding cutters, the physicality, the pressure. You know, it brings out the best in you, and if it's not something that's comfortable, I, I think that those types of players and people, they're not going to be captivated by the Big East. And I think JP represents that type of player that we try to recruit because he's going to not only survive in this conference, but eventually he will thrive in it. And that's what he did. You think about it. And at the end, when he was the leader, the true leader and the most experienced player, him and Trayvon had the number one seed in the NCAA tournament in a Big East regular season championship, which is two of the most difficult things to accomplish as a player uh, in this game. He did something else really cool. He's he's become immortalized in in a meme. Do you know what a meme is? Yes. Yeah. The, What's this one? This is the, the dunk at Seton Hall. Oh. The picture of the aftermath of that dunk. It was such a great dunk. I don't know. Well, we'll those guys were running their mouth yeah. too, right in the front row at Seton <laughs> Hall too. And I, I was like, screw it. I'm going to put this one back. <laughs> uh, well, Wisconsin too. Walking. What do you remember from that? That was really fun to play there as well. Um, they were, to be honest, I don't remember them like the game we play and I don't think they played well at all. And we, I don't remember how much we won by, but that environment, those guys, they, they got, 20, 30 people giving me the middle finger before I had done anything to them. I didn't do anything. I didn't talk to the fans the whole game. And I gave them the little gator clap, clap and they lost their mind. And then I was the bad guy. After the game was over, just gave them a little gesture, and I got flagged as the bad guy. But <laughs> it's fine by me. <laughs> the, uh, the only other thing I wanted to say, because... I knew you were coming back this weekend. And I think with the the way college basketball is now with the transfer portal and all this other stuff, I'm curious, Coach, like, or both of your thoughts on it. But I remember when I first got around Xavier, one of the things people talked to me about was how much one recruiting class, the right recruiting class, can change a program. And a great example of that is your recruiting class and what those guys did what they became, the success that they had. Like, do you think that's going to happen much anymore with just the way that you can go out and get a guy for a year like Quincy? Or maybe you're not going to be as reliant on bringing in four freshmen or five mm -hmm. freshmen every year. Is that still going to be a thing? We had six. Six. Yeah. That's a, that's a so lot. So I, I would say this, that, yes, the recruiting class will have the same impact, but I don't think it will have the impact over a long period. So it's not going to be that class impacted the next four years. I think that class could certainly impact a couple, but I, I don't think it will be for four anymore. And it's, that's the, the adjustment that we all have to make, whether you're a fan, a coach, or, or somebody that, that's a player. But, yeah. I mean, I, I think back to a class here. You had uh, two Holloway, Mark Lyons, and Jordan Crawford. Uh, and Kenny Freeze, all of them were a part of the same class. Brad Redford would have been a part of that class as well. And you just think about the impact that each of them had. Jordan, not for as long, but, you know, to Holloway, I mean, you're talking about a four-year impact similar to JP and Trayvon. But, yeah, I, I think the class will still be impactful, maybe not for four years. We might have had five. I don't think we had six. Oh well, but but still, I mean the the names that were four in that year class, impact yeah. though yeah. to his point. Yeah, it was some transfer, but some stayed, and it would, it, it definitely worked out. <laughs> <laughs> JP, uh, 
just to wrap this up, congratulations on being inducted into the Xavier Hall of Fame. It's one of the highest honors you have here at Xavier, and um, nobody else, nobody better to, to go in that class and to go in alongside Trayvon, too. I know he can't be here tonight, um, but just to go in alongside him, how much does that mean to you and to be honored like this here at Xavier? I mean, it means the world, honestly. Um, over my four years at Xavier, I truthfully never really cared about and I know a lot of people say this, but I truthfully didn't care about how many points I scored or what my stats were. Um, and to be recognized five years after, um, or sometime after, to be recognized as, as a Hall of Fame member is just, uh, I'm super blessed and, and grateful for it because it's being recognized for more than just points and rebounds and assists. It's just having an impact on the university and the program. and. Trayvon will say the same thing. I know he's in Italy um, playing right now, but we're both super grateful for, for this opportunity and, and thankful. Um, but we wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, playing here at Centos in front of these amazing fans for four years is, is remarkable. So I'm just very grateful for this. JP, thanks again for joining us today on the Sean Miller Podcast. Best of luck to you and uh, to your family and, and everything going forward for you. Thanks, Congrats, guys. JP, and good luck. Thank you, yeah. guys. Thanks to everybody for watching the Sean Miller Podcast. As always, you can follow us on social media at Sean Miller Pod. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff. Thanks to Deer Park Roofing, TGE Solar, Payroll Partners, and everybody that helps make this show possible. This has been another episode of the Sean Miller Podcast. This has been the Sean Miller Podcast, presented by Deer Park Roofing, with your hosts, Paul Fritschner and Adam Bow. Join us again soon for another episode with the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller.